Uh, so my name is Dana Abadi. I'm a data and AI technical specialist uh, based in IBM Saudi Arabia. I focus on AI for business, uh, Gen AI and traditional AI as well, and AI applications, and really bringing uh, this technology closer to home for enterprise clients. It's actually a very exciting event. And it's all about bringing the top innovators, uh, all of the big enterprises projects um, within Saudi Arabia, together with the audiences, the techies, the enthusiasts. It's really an event for all to focus on the latest and greatest when it comes to technology, serving the business, serving Vision 2030, uh, serving the community. We're going to have a series of different activities and um, things to present. I'll be on stage a couple of days of the week talking about AI for business and you know the hype around generative AI and how can we actually bring it closer to home when it comes to enterprises and business. I'll also be talking about some very common use cases when it comes to utilizing AI to drive our workflows, uh, what digital labor means and what it doesn't mean, it does not mean replacing humans, uh, it means putting AI at the service of humans. I'll also be around at the demo side of things. So these are uh, experiences where we're showing you a glimpse of different industry use cases where we're utilizing different technologies to really deliver value. So excited to see you there. Generative AI is basically a new form of AI that's you know been the hype um, for the past couple of years. Uh, and it's around a new uh, mode of experimentation uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. So whereas with traditional AI, we used to have, or we still have actually, uh, we design models that are very specific uh, to a certain task, and we call it more supervised learning. We provide a lot of labeled data. Data scientists spend a lot of time preparing data to perform very specific tasks, like predicting the weather, um, like uh, uh, detecting an object. Generative AI is based on something we call foundation models, which are large models trained on huge amounts of data. And what's cool about these models is that they actually self-supervise in terms of their learning. So they are able to learn some tasks that we did not explicitly train them to do, which actually raises the big potential for value, uh, value add, um, uh, much quicker uh, go-to-market uh, go route. Um, and a lot of new experimentation. So a lot of the things that we could do with traditional AI, we could now do much faster in a more creative way with generative AI. Um, I don't think we exaggerate when we say that this is an opportunity of a lifetime um, because there's so much potential that comes with generative AI. And a big part of this, uh, this potential is because it's become very accessible to everyone. So all of a sudden, AI became a topic that we can talk about at the dinner table. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be a data scientist or even a, a technical person to be involved in generative AI applications. So I think it's not just the potential of these models to really drive productivity, to really bring value, to make our you know, conversational AI more interesting, our experiences more rich or richer. Uh, it's actually around um, it being very easily adaptable by users. And I think businesses need to capitalize on that, but of course, uh, while still keeping the guardrails that they need to keep and the policies and the regulations. So that's the kind of vision we should be forming right now. So a foundation model, if I can make that analogy, is like an amazing, astounding PhD graduate someone who's learned a lot, who's acquired a lot of uh, information, a lot of experience. Uh, foundation models are naturally trained on large amounts of data. And that data could be text data, it could be images, it could be videos, depending on the kind of foundation models, could be audio as well, of course. And the idea with these models, this term was actually coined by Stanford University, is that um, they are they can be the foundation for a lot of use cases that are uh, completely new to them. So you don't explicitly train these models. These models make predictions on uh, based on uh, self-supervised learning methodologies. They make predictions and they are able to perform tasks like summarize an article, like suggest create an itinerary, create something from scratch that no one has seen before. So not really based on labeled data. And of course, they can be fine-tuned. Um, um, you interact with them using natural language, which is what we call prompting or prompt engineering. Probably this word is being heard a lot right now. So uh, they have a lot of potential, um, whether to be used raw, but mostly or actually always with businesses and enterprises, it's actually a fine-tuned version of the model where it's a customized to fit a big business need and business policy um, that's actually, that actually should go into production. 
and all of us have that uh, fear, you know, have that concern with AI and now generative AI. Can it do my job? And I think it's more what we need to be aware of is more of in the future, people who know AI or who leverage AI in their job roles, regardless whether it's in development or other stuff, um, should would can, will replace people who do not embrace AI. But it's not AI that's going to replace these roles. So AI is about boosting your productivity. So as developers, you know, we we are used to, uh, for example, using starter kits, using um, certain frameworks, you know, using, we, we don't always write things from scratch and we can use generative AI for such things. So it lays down the foundation, but it's always a human in the loop kind of thing. So designing the algorithm, the solution architecture, knowing what kind of technologies, optimizing and all of that, it still needs the human decision-making, but instead of spending time on syntax and, you know, moving from programming language to another, for example, this is where generative AI can provide a lot of value, but then we do the supervision or the developers do the supervision. So I don't think they need to be worried, but I think we, uh, them and all, all our job roles, honestly, we need to be creative about them and we need to embrace change because they will change, whether it's now or in a few years. Although we do, do invest in, in creating our own foundation models and large language models, which is uh, short, uh, the short versions LLM, um, which is what powers ChatGPT, for example, they're uh, model, foundation models that are specialized in language. So we do have our own models, but what we, what our offering or our promise is with Watson X is a platform. And the idea with a platform is actually three ways. There's a part that's concerned with the data because we have always said there's no AI without IA, no artificial intelligence without information architecture. So a big part of it is about the data curation, preparing such big data uh, for the future to fine tune, to train a model uh, with optimized performance. Another part is what we call watsonx.ai, which is the studio. And the studio is about embracing, about being open and very targeted. We believe that as enterprises and businesses use generative AI, they're not going to just use one model to solve all of their use cases. They're going to need to use different models, some for certain language tasks, some that are with more industry knowledge. So the idea is to bring the best of both worlds. So to bring some models from open source, to offer our own IBM models, which are very specific to enterprise targeted, our data is clear, we offer indemnification on them as well. And we're also bringing the bring your own model capability. The idea is the studio, the platform, the collaboration. So business users can sit, try out some prompts, try out what fits their business use case better, share with their colleagues in a no code environment, and then easily deploy, and then be able to monitor. Uh, which brings me to the third pillar of this Watson X platform, which is the governance, WatsonX.gov. That's the governance side of things. You know, with any new technology, we have risks such as ethics, bias, uh, what's the underlying data. And we, we all see, you know, the potential harm of AI or any technology. So it's very important to keep all of these um, uh, governance rules to stay in compliance as co as countries are issuing regulations around AI and generative AI. So to monitor that, to uh, track uh, mod uh, models for, you know, wrong information, profanity, hallucinations, and so on, and then integrate this into the functionality of the GRC, the Governance Risk and Compliance Department of the company or the organization. This is what WatsonX.Governance does. So it regulates the models that we have in the studio. So it's the end-to-end -end life cycle because what we're talking about right now is AI for business, not just AI to, you know, create an itinerary for me and I can, you know, go and experiment and no harm, no foul. The principles that we recommend or our point of view is to be open, to embrace, again, not this LLM is the greatest LLM of all times, but actually embracing openness, looking for the best models um, out there, uh, models that we can trust as well. Um, so open is an important part, uh, being targeted. So when we say targeted, you know, we have, they're all large models, but we have, you know, large, large models and we have small, large models. Um, and then, and the key thing with being targeted and what we're focusing on, and actually that's becoming a trend in the, in the market is to focus on what we call small language models or medium language models, which are still trained on a significant amount of data, but are not huge in terms of uh, parameters and data. And this is to add control. This is to ease the training. This is to make it more sustainable, whether it's for, you know, the budgets of the organizations or even for the environment, because at the end of the day, the caveat here is the hardware where we're hosting this on and the impact it has on the environment. 
So the more targeted we are, the more we know our use case that the best, the better we know sorry, our use case, um, the better we can, the better we can choose the model and it can be targeted and specific and we can do some customization and achieve results that are on par with very large models. And also, of course, trust is very important. So whether it's traditional AI or generative AI, it's important to have transparency. It's important to have governance, uh, the ethics around it, ar the, around the kind of use cases that we're creating to be able to follow regulations, know what went in and what w went out. And, and this is, you know, for any kind of business process and AI shouldn't be an exception and the contrary, actually, especially with such powerful technology. Uh, so trust is very important. And then being empowering. So the whole uh, buzz around generative AI came because it's it's close to home for a lot of people. It's relatable. We use natural language to interact with, with such models. We write in our own words and in our own uh, styles. And this is very important. So how can we actually um, bring this to the business users, to the, real, to the experts, um, as well as, of course, the data scientists and the IT team? So something for all. So I would say it's it's these four being open, targeted, uh, working with trust and offering something that's empowering to all. If we make informed decisions, um, if and especially as people have realized the importance of governance and and being very careful and how much our technology can actually mimic our own biases and the, our, you know, the problems that already exist in the world. So it's important for us to always think that the technology is at the end of the day a human creation. And we contribute a lot into everything that AI does, whether even if it's technology that we do not fully understand, it all should be under our control. So if we make the right decisions, we, if we embrace that change and not fear it, then we will able to be able to you know, set up the rules that work for us and control it and actually steer it towards you know, the benefits and the good things, um, uh, the uh, having representative data, avoiding any you know, um, harm, any profanity, any you know, fake news, all of the problems that we observe in the world, a lot of it can be solved by AI and a lot of it can be actually made worse by AI. So it's really, you know, our litmus test, let's say. Um, but I do think that the future is positive. And I think the earlier we think and envision the future, the more we can protect it and actually create something that's meaningful.